All right. And we sh Hello, everybody, and how are you today? This is Danya. This is Brian. And we are live with you guys today um, on our special with Intolerance. Does Intolerance have a place in genealogy and our panel? So I'm going to turn this over to Brian as he introduces our panel, and I share this amongst the rest of our groups. Oh, I thought we, I thought you were. What? I thought, we were I thought you were introducing, sorry. <laughs> no, you're going to introduce because I want to make sure everybody, you know, really kind of gets this. It is it is live and kicking right now. We already have like 50 people watching. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And we have a great panel today um, across the genealogy spectrum. I'm really, really pleased to have the diversity. Thank you for joining us. Diversity of people and experience on the panel. So I'm just going to do it in order, and everyone's going to kind of speak a little bit about themselves and, and uh, let you know a little bit more about themselves. But I'm pleased to welcome Pauline Merrick, Bernice Bennett, Janice Gilliard, um, Yaya Gordon. Uh, is it is Yaya or yet Yael? It's Yael, but it goes by Yaya, yes. Yael, okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Stacy Cole, Catherine Knight, and of course, you know, the, the, the wonderful Donia. So this is, this is our team today. So I suppose going in order, Pauline, would you like to just, um, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Uh, I live in Connecticut, and I am the vice president of the Connecticut Society of Genealogists. And I have been doing some African-American genealogy for friends but also exploring um, the same subject in New England. It's kind of an untapped area for genealogy right now um, and trying to educate other people as to where to find records for this and for people doing their researching their white Puritan ancestors to not be so shocked when they see those uh, estate lists and stuff and find out that their ancestors were also enslavers. Thank you for that. And uh, Bernice, Bernice, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a podcaster. I have a weekly show called Research at the National Archives and Beyond Blog Talk Radio. I'm an author, family historian, and, and overall, I, I love genealogy. I love collaborating with people, and that's kind of who I am and what I do. Thank you very much. And Janice. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janice Gilliard, and I'm from Summit, New Jersey. I'm the president of Ox, New Jersey, Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, as well as being a family historian and genealogist for over 25 years. Thank you, Janice. And Stacy. Hi, I'm Stacy Cole. I'm from Brunswick, Georgia. I'm president of the Coastal Georgia Genealogical Society. About three years ago, I discovered that I was uh, descended from an enslaver in Liberty County, Georgia, started doing research and um, created a website called theyhadnames.net to document the names of um, African Americans enslaved and free in antebellum uh, Liberty County records. We have about 30,000 references now uh, dating from colonial times to the Civil War. And thank you. And for those of you who are familiar with my work on the, the Weeping Time people, the 440 souls who were, who were sold in Georgia, Stacy is one of the people um, on the research group. Um, and her work in Liberty County just moved my own research ahead light years. Oh, wonderful. So thank you for that, Stacey. Um, and Catherine. Hey, I'm Catherine Knight. I am first and foremost a genealogist. I am a 1619 historian. I am an international award-winning author with several African American um, historical books. And you can find a lot of my work at 1619 Genealogy, Descendants of the 20 and Odd, which is a Facebook group that I 
um, put a lot of my information out on. And again, for Catherine, her book Unveiled, which is about the 1619 Africans in Virginia. Again, your book propelled my, just probably shaved about 12 years off of my research. Um, that, was, that was such an awesome book, um, especially because I know that I was descended from them. So thank you for that. And Yaya. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, hi, my name is Yael um, Yaya Gordon, and um, I am a historian and a genealogist based in Louisiana, and I'm the owner of the Ancestor Key um, Genealogy um, Group. And I research particularly in Louisiana and Mississippi, and I specialize in enslaved history. And I'm also the president of Augs here in Louisiana. And again, thank you to our superb panel for, for coming together on a Saturday afternoon. And thank you all of you guys, whether you're at home or at work for uh, tuning in today. So this show was very, was very dear to Donia's heart. It's uh, something that she and I have been talking about. We tended to notice that over the summer, specifically after the death of George Floyd, that there was a lot of kind of intolerance and bullying in some Facebook genealogy research groups. And you know, Donnie and I probably spent about a good two or three days kind of talking about it, trying to understand what was behind it, what was propelling it, and why we were seeing it more in some genealogy groups than others. So I mean, to give you an example, there was a young, a young gentleman who identifies as being white, who did a DNA test and found out that he had a black ancestor. He has sub-Saharan um, ancestry. So doing the kind of critical thinking, logical thing that anyone in that circumstance would do, especially if you had no understanding or no knowledge that you had a black ancestor, um, he posted in an in African-American genealogy group. Can you basically ask him, can you give me help or tell me, you know, tell me where to search or how to search to find this unknown uh, African ancestor and the abuse he got, not from everyone, it, was, it really was a small minority of people, but the, the vitriol and the language that was used was, was really upsetting. Uh, and Donnie and I were trying to make the point that genealogy is meant to be inclusive. Um, it's supposed to be a welcoming community. Uh, as Bernice was, was rightly saying, you know, a collaborative community of, of people coming together and working together. And I thought that that was a perfectly valid post to make, but people are like, well, this is an African-American genealogy group. You're not African-American, why are you posting? And it was either that day or the day before a young lady who, who um, is a descendant of slave holders basically posted saying, listen, I've got documents that lists enslaved people. Is it okay if I actually post those documents in this group? And then she got it. And then Donnie and I were kind of talking and Donnie is like, well, you know what Donnie is like, we have to do a show. So we're doing a show. <laughs> Donnie, did you want to, um, to wait in on that one? Uh-huh. So, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, to, to, to kind of go on, basically just to clarify some stuff, he was actually asking about the culture and he wanted to know about the the culture and that's why they went off on him they were like it's not your culture so why do you want to know so I was livid because who are you to say who's someone what is someone's culture and or who are you to call out who is dark enough or light enough to be black or white I you know we we come specifically black people come in all complexions. And I, so I'm, those were issues for me. And um, the, I, I guess what we're trying to do here today is to have our panel discuss and explain both. If you guys notice, we have black and white panelists and we want them to give both sides. We want them to explain what genealogy actually is, what genealogy actually does, and how both sides benefit. And how both sides, is it a, a backbeat? How both sides um, help each other. 
find out our family, how to find out how to connect and help each other and how um, both sides work together to best, I guess, to best um, find our families. That's what genealogy is. That's what genealogy does. The George Floyd thing was a horrible thing. The things that are going on today is a horrible thing, but they are not the same as genealogy. That's what needs to be understood. They're two different things. So this is what we're trying to address. And this is what we're trying to get done. Now, I, I got some, I want everybody to understand, we want your feedback. We want you to put questions on these comments. We want you on, on the comment section. We want you to, you know, this is a, a safe space. And we want you to say what you have to say. We want you to get get your, you know, get your get your thoughts out here and say what you have to say because this is what we we want you to say. Can we I want you to get it out there, but you know, yeah. Okay, can go I, ahead. Can I just jump in really quickly? Um, please keep your comments constructive. Right. Um, and respectful. And respectful. That was the word I was looking for as well. Thank you. Yeah, and respectful. We want you to be respectful. You have to be respectful. Um, but it's still a, that's why it's a safe place because you need to be respectful. But this has to be out there. So with that being said, um, ladies, I would like for you guys to like really share how you felt because I've shared some of those comments with you guys as far as when that young man was attacked. I shared the, what I did was I put you, I, I put your names, I tagged you guys on that. And um, you saw the attacks that was on this young man and then the comments that was going back and forth when I said, okay, this is not what we, then when I posted what the group was, what the group was about. What were your feelings when you saw that stuff? You could take turns. Well, or I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, mm -hmm. I, I gave a lot of thought to this and thank you all for actually um, you know, asking me to participate and be on the panel. One thing is, and you already said it, Zanya, we have to respect one another and we have to be able to have a conversation. And in that conversation, people may make, they may make mistakes um, innocently. I think you have to look at the intent. So to ask a question, and if it's genealogy related, even if you feel some way about the culture, there's a way to have a conversation. There's a way to come back and say, what do you mean by that? So I made a quick note, like we have to respect one another. We have to be careful in our responses to one another. And then we have to have that dialogue. I should be able to ask a question and not be attacked. And even if the question may be offensive to some, there's a way to even come back and say, well, wait a minute, what are you trying to understand? Or um, let, let's, let's have a further conversation about it. Attacking is not going to work. Um, in groups, you know, you set your ground rules for the group. And if you're not gonna adhere to that, or if you're gonna just close yourself off it's not gonna work, we're never gonna to come together. So to me, it's important to be respectful as Donya has already said, it's important to be able to have a conversation. It's important to feel that I'm safe and not attacked. Because in my research, I find I need everybody and we have to be able to talk. You might have something that can help me. I may have something that can help you. But if we're all going at each other, a lot of people are not going to be helped or if something needs to be corrected, if we're fighting with one another, the correction is never gonna happen and we're never gonna make progress. So I think that we just have to be a little more open and respectful and considerate and say, wait a minute, what is the question at hand? So that, that was my take on it, that we have to be respectful and really hear one another and be able to communicate with one another and make progress. You know, I wanna just say, we also, need to recognize that not everything is going to feel good. Right. And what we're talking about are emotions. 
And let's just face it, a lot's going on. A lot is going on right now. And sometimes people just allow their emotions to just run. And yes, it does sometimes come across as bullying, but it happens on both sides too. It's the person who is African-American that find that they have uh, white ancestors and they reach out and they get a response back. No, this is not the case. We have no black people in our family. I think you are absolutely right. There is a place for the conversation and you have to figure out how to work this conversation in such a way that you both come to an understanding. Yes. What is the mission of this group? What are our expectations? As you said, there has to be ground rules and you have to adhere to those ground rules. And this is part of the growth process that both sides have to go through. But keep in mind, emotions will take over. And genealogy, as much as you would like to think that is not emotional, it is extremely yes. emotional. Mm -hmm. It is extremely emotional in that there, there's a book out right now called The Cast System. The Cast, The Origins of, of uh, Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson. Now, when you start reading this book, you start recognizing and understanding what she's saying about what group is up and what group is down. And so it's something that we all have to engage in this conversation. And I'm really glad that this is a conversation that you've even proposed that we, we get involved in. We're, we need to talk more because how many of you are part of genealogy societies where this dialogue has never taken place. So I'll end my, my little soap. Sorry about the noise in the background, y'all. My children can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna jump in really quickly. Um, I think I'm absolutely correct. I think one of the things that we have to remember that Everyone is not always able to articulate exactly what they're trying to say. So sometimes it can come off right. as um, being insensitive when it's not meaning in, it was not being mean in that particular sense. So it's great to ask questions, but we have to have an open space. And I would say safe space, even though if that is an, not the term or phrase everyone likes to hear and it makes it seem as though we're giving more an advantage to one group over the other, but it has literally has to be a safe space for everybody to be able to communicate and, and learn amongst each other. And I think that understanding, people have to realize that understanding does not mean acceptance. You can understand something, but still not agree with it. Exactly. And being an advocate against bullying lifelong advocate that works with bullying, words affect people, words harm people. And sometimes people are, are spoken to in a derogatory manner and they don't even realize that they're speaking to someone that way and they can push a person into a hole and they can completely close up and shut down and not be forthcoming. And that very person who may now feel attacked could have all the information that you may need but you'll never get that information because you have now put yourself in a situation to where they do not feel comfortable with speaking to you. Yes, it's, it's difficult history. I teach on difficult history every single day, but it is something that we have to be able to process and not suppress because that is the, a big enemy, being able to just, just have it here. And it's, I always say, if there's an elephant in the room, introduce him. You have to be able to have those kind of conversations and everybody should be able to have a voice. We cannot minimize voice. My minimized voice is just because of someone's racial makeup or background. Now, if they're speaking hatred, that's something completely different, but every voice needs to be able to be open to express and be able to, if everyone, to actually hear them. Stacey? Sorry, I had to unmute myself and accidentally stop my video. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I was thinking about this and I was looking at those posts and I was thinking that you have to come to Facebook with a very tough skin, hopefully an open heart, but a very tough skin because it's like the wild west. There's all kinds of people right. on Facebook groups and the moderation can't step in at the exact moment. So I was actually encouraged and I've been encouraged in a lot of these groups to see 
how uh, sensitive people are in speaking to the person who's spoken, even if they haven't expressed themselves um, exactly correctly because uh, this is the first time they've broached the subject. So there are those few people who, um, who are hateful, but we don't know where they're coming from. We don't know what kind of trauma has led to whatever they're expressing in that moment. It might not be who they normally are either. It just struck them on the wrong day. And I think sensitive moderation, the way I've seen in the, I've traced my, uh, now I'm blanking out of the names, but I've traced my um, <laughs> ancestors in slavery. Um, uh, I think that can really go a long way toward making the person who spoke up feel like, okay, some people don't like this, but I need to learn from it. And I've seen a lot of wonderful conversations come out of those very tough interactions. So I, I think that they're, they're good interactions and that there's no way to prevent um, people from expressing difficult emotions during those kind of interactions, but that we can learn from them and, um, I'd also like to say that um, I'm seeing these kinds of discussions in these groups and not in the primarily white oriented genealogy groups. And I think there's a lot of credit to be given there. I'm gonna come back to that, but I think Catherine wanted to say something and then um, if Pauline wanted to talk as well, but I'm definitely gonna come back to that. What I wanted to talk about for just a second, everyone has touched on and that is emotion. We, there's something out there that is emotional trauma. We are all dealing with it right now. But in addition to that, there's something called historical trauma. We know, um, I, have, I have recently been for the last six months to a year involved with a new type of therapy. And it's in the early stages of clinical trials. And we're finding that there are so many triggers that historical trauma causes. Just like if you're in a Facebook group and somebody, or for instance, someone asked me, who gave you the right to write those books? Mm -hmm. And at the time I didn't know how to answer that. I didn't know what to think. But now that I have been involved in this therapy, I realize there are so many little tidbits that become um, triggers. And those triggers, we don't know what they are. We don't know why. It could be my face as being, that is white. There's a lot of things that are within our own DNA and we're seeing that over and over. And it's something that will come out that we will get more of an explanation about in the next year or two. There are things though on the horizon and it, it, are, it's, it involves DNA, it involves historical, the trauma that, if think about going back 14 to 15 generations, what did your ancestors see? And all of that is within you. So when we start judging, I try to step back and realize, and especially lately, because I understand more, I think, what is the trigger? The first question, what triggered that response? Was it, it's something someone has dealt with? And I, tr and I don't judge. I, I, have, I have taken myself out of it because I realize now everyone is dealing with something. And if we can step back for just a second and realize the historical trauma that is within our own self, Every one of us have, has, has a huge amount of historical trauma, no matter what side you're on. Um, no matter if you're black, no matter if you're white, no matter if you're tan, I don't, it doesn't matter. You have, you have this within you and it's something that we all need to realize. We as genealogists see all that historical trauma. We see what people went through and the pain they felt. And I think as genealogists, if we can get this information out um, and help people understand why they're feeling that way. So that's just a little tidbit I wanted to throw in there because it's, it's something I'm dealing with currently. We're looking at this, these therapies, it's something on the horizon, but I think it is very, um, if we can just step back and, and understand it's not always directed at us. It's a, it's a trigger. Is something that someone has has within. It could be years um, years ago. It could be generations ago. But we are feeling it, and we don't know why. So that we just need to take into account everything everyone is dealing with. I don't take anything personal anymore. I really yeah, don't. Yeah, epigenetics is a real thing. It, it's definitely a real thing. Um, Pauline, did you want to? Yeah, um, just wanted to add to that, that, you know, genealogists as a group come from a variety of backgrounds and other disciplines, and some are 
highly educated. Some are, you know, maybe have a high school education, but you know, this is something they become interested in. But if you really want to experience bullying, log on to a new genealogy group where they don't know you and post that you went back 10 generations on your family tree by copying other people's stuff from ancestry family trees <laughs> and let the comments start. <laughs> so we all have to kind of, kind of recognize that people are coming from different places and different levels of experience. Somebody can, can come on with a perfectly innocent question that the experienced members of the group are like, well, that's obvious. You know, that's a stupid question. But it isn't because this person doesn't doesn't have that knowledge yet, and it's up to us to to bring them up to speed, so to speak. Right, Bernice. Oh, Bernice. One one second. Bernice has something to say, and then um, Janice. Yes, what I wanted to say is that yes, we are genealogists, and you just mentioned Catherine. Something triggers. Well, let's look at what's been going on just recently. This current climate has triggered a whole lot of trauma in people. And it's, it's scary. It's very scary. And so I don't know where the person was coming from that responded. No, none of us know. But I think we can't, we can't divorce ourselves from what's happening within this country right now from what we're doing in genealogy. You can't, you just, you can't separate it. It's, it's all happening together. Even to the point where you saw companies and genealogists and people writing apologies after what we witnessed on television with Mr. Floyd. Well, that triggered a whole lot in people. Mm -hmm. And still triggering where you, where you hear people talking about they have to give the talk. Well, how many people even know about the talk that has to take place in the African-American community just to make sure that the children, especially the male children or, and the female children have to be safe and have to know how to behave so that they, when they go out, they come back home alive. Janice. Two things, um, a lot of people, they wanna be, oh, I want you to understand me. I want you to understand, but sometimes, or I want to be understood. Sometimes you have to understand in order to be understood. The other thing is you mm. can't fix what you don't face, what you don't or won't face. And so to me, this is a perfect opportunity for us to, and we're having the honest conversation that there's a lot of stuff that's not right. And in order to just to even begin to fix it, we have to Face it. And it's interesting that you, um, Catherine, you were talking about DNA. Bernice and I had a long conversation yesterday about the power of DNA. And it is a very real thing. And that trauma is real. We purchased a home in South Carolina. And every time we rode by, we would pull up into the driveway. There's a huge tree there. I don't know how old it is, but it's, I mean, like old, old. And I was the only person that got this sad, overwhelming feeling. And my husband was like, well, you're supposed to be happy. We're buying our second home. You're supposed to be happy. Why aren't you happy? I said, I don't know. I said, every time we pull up, I just get this bad feeling. Years later, I found out that number one, I bought the prop, my ancestors lived in that area where I brought the property from. This is after the fact. We were just, and, and we weren't planning to buy it. We were led to buy it. Secondly, I said to myself, I said, you know what? They lynched people mm -hmm. were lynched from that tree. And that's why I had this sad feeling. And it happened several times. The moment I verbalized that people were lynched from that tree is when the feeling lifted and there was joy and victory in the fact that a descendant of my, I'm, I'm a descendant of my enslaved ancestors and I'm buying the property where they couldn't own anything, where they couldn't speak up. So DNA trauma is real having the conversation you know my husband said something he had a conversation with someone he teaches his students and there are people teacher other teachers who get upset at him and he said what is it about what i'm teaching which is true what is it that makes you uncomfortable so i had someone say to me oh well slavery you know uh uh the, the civil war wasn't about slavery excuse me so we have to for people that make and I'm just going to be very honest, and this is not, I'm not trying to be rude. When you make ignorant com comments like that, 
you have to go and educate yourself. And so what I did, I didn't, I was upset, but I kept talking to her. This is my coworker who's white. And we kept talking. And then I said, if you want to understand what's going on now, go watch uh, the Recon Black Reconstruction Reconstruction by Skip Gates. Go watch that. So, so you can, and she watched it. And she came back and she said, you know what? I never knew. So a lot of times people are speaking just based on what families have said. And they believe, oh, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. But when you go back and do the research and you look at it, yes, it was. So we have to educate ourselves. We have to deal with the issues. We have to confront what is not right or what's being handled in the wrong way in order to fix it. So I, that's my sentiment for today. We're facing it. And maybe this is a really good attempt to help fix it. We Can we fix everything? No, but we can have the conversation. We can correct the narratives that, out there, that are out there that are false. And then and only then when we face the truth, can we really move forward? If not, then we're all playing a game. You know, my feeling is, is that, and, and I didn't get this way until I started doing research, is that um, I think a genealogist should be on every board in every way, in every sense of the word, because um, I think they should be at every table, because we actually um, have a, a, a knowledge that some people, that most people don't. And that includes, that includes historians. And why do I feel that way? Because historians only know what they want you to know. So, whereas with genealogy, we have a, um, we have a sense of, of knowledge of what our families actually went through. So, for example, you started talking about that tree. I knew exactly what you were saying. Every last one of us on this panel knew that someone was hung from that tree. We knew it. We knew why you got sad. Everybody on here knew you got sad because somebody was hung and they let you know that somebody was hung from that tree. I knew it because I was getting ready to say, so who was hung? That's <laughs> I, mean, I just was ready to say it. So who was hung from the tree? The feeling was there. I caught the feeling. Everybody caught that feeling. But I just feel like there we should be a genealogist should be at everybody's table, every on every board on everything because they have a knowledge. They have a feeling for what's going on in every sense of the word. Um, but I wanted to go back to something that Stacy, um, excuse me, that Stacy was saying about um, not having this particular issue in some of the traditionally white genealogy groups. As far as bullying is concerned, I was in, I am in, I am a member of the U.S. South Research Genealogy Group. I do not say anything in that group because they got mad at me because I was talking about my enslaved ancestor. Is that not a form of bullying? Oh, well, when we publicized your book yep. and created the Com Comes to the Light Facebook page to promote your book, and we, you know, we spoke about Martha, Martha Brooks, who was a breeder, and the vitriol, the yep. comment. I mean, I, I will always remember that one woman and you know, the, the lyrics of Frozen, let it go. How are you going to like, and you had to explain to her, this is my two times great grandmother. This isn't some hypothetical person. This is her blood runs through my veins. Right. And, she, and she was a breeder. Right. You know, and you were explaining, if you were talking about, you know, well, if your great grandmother was like a pioneer in Kentucky and got killed in a confrontation with Native Americans, you feel free to be able to discuss that, but you're going to have a go at me for talking about my enslaved ancestors. This, this right. is, you know, you were making the point, this is literally my ancestry. You also made another really good point, Danya, about genealogists being on either organizational or company boards. Classic example, and I'm really sorry, Ancestry, I know it always seems as though I'm like dragging on you, but I lit, this is a brand new advert, just saw it about half an hour before the show went live. Beautiful video, you know, beautiful advert, lovely African-American woman talking about how she had solved some of um, her genealogy problems with ancestry, but they were talking about women's suffrage. 
And they were showing, you know, women dressed in that period, a lot of white women, but black women as well. And we know that African-American women supported the, the women's suffrage movement, but you would think that black women were able to vote from that point. Mm -hmm. And we know that black women couldn't vote until right. decades, decades later. And again, a knowledgeable, whether it was a, a historian or a genealogist or a public historian could have told them that in a heartbeat. You can use the photo, you can have that in, in, you know, in the advertisements script, but you should also include this because it's misleading. People will watch that advert and they'll think, oh, all women can vote from that time period. Correcting I also want to, the narrative. Correcting the narrative, which we have to do all the time. And I wanted to comment on something that Bernice raised because she made a really good point about anger. I get why people are angry. This has been a long, hot, angry song. Actually, it's just been a long hot Year. <laughs> three, three and a half years of anger, if we're going to be honest. Because really, if you look at the origin story of this, it goes all the way back to, the, to Charlottesville and what happened there. So the point I want to make is I get why people are angry. I wish people could point their anger in the right direction. Someone posting something in a genealogy or family history Facebook group or page is not the, not the people or the, the, what led to George Floyd being killed or Breonna Taylor or Ahmaud Arbery or any of the people who've, who've been killed. So why direct your anger at them? Direct your anger at, towards social change, the Justice Department, the, you know, um, law enforcement, social inequities. Point your anger, that, that's the constructive place to put your anger. Not someone who's coming with a question or needs advice or needs information. Can I jump in on there really quickly? Because um, I, I, I too have dealt with the bullying in other in non-Black genealogy groups. And I can um, speak from personal experience, um, but it's a little bit different experience. When I would post, in, well, um, one of my peeves is, is trees with no information in it. And you're looking for stuff and it's like, who, who are these ghost people? Who are these phantom people when no one is there? And you may post something about, okay, you know, try to increase your tree, try to increase the individuals that are in the tree so you can help other, other, other individuals, so on and so forth. You post it in, in a black, um, a mainly black genealogy group, you may get responses, but they, they're not harsh. But the moment you post that in a majority white genealogy group, the attacks come out of the woods. You get the, well, we don't know who our family were. We, we, we don't know who our parents were. We were adopted. We were this, that, and the other. And I'm thinking, well, black people were as well, but our adoption circumstances may be a little bit different. We may have given our child to a relative or something of that sort. But it's, it's such a defense that comes from so many people that post and it's, it, it becomes an attack. So you really see the difference in how people are treated, but it shows just how the cultural differences are. Because while legal adoption may, be, may have been prominent in one particular culture, they may not have been in, an, in another. And people aren't even willing to see that. They're not willing to see the differences. And like it was mentioned, you have, you are to be understood, you have to be understanding. But individuals don't want to cross that line and, and they live in these silos as though what they've gone through is all that actually exists. And so in many of those groups, I don't even post either because the backlash you'll immediately get is extreme and it's, and it's unnecessary and it becomes catty because I think sometimes people become catty because they want to make, they don't want to add on to the struggle as to make it a woe is me kind of thing. Oh, I struggle too. I, have, I, I can't do my tree because I don't know who my parents are or a doctor. So whatever the case. And just almost inserting yourself into someone else's story. No, there are really some people who just don't put up trees because they're lazy. That, that's, that's, that's life. That, that's fact. But the, again, the backlash is, is completely unnecessary. And I just wish that these conversations like this is happening today could actually happen in some of those groups. But I'm not even sure that that's, many of those people would be very forthcoming to do so. Right. So I, I asked 
as as I was telling you, ladies and gents, um, before we got started, I did go to some of both our Black genealogy groups and our white genealogy groups, and I asked if we could make these posts in there so it could be available to um, to them that they could, you know, definitely, so we could post it and people could talk about it, have their, you know, have their conversations up here, you know, talk about the bullying. And I, I was able to do it in some of our black groups, but I was only able to post in one white group. And they did not, um, yes, I am receiving comments. I'm gonna read from them shortly. Um, I was only able to post in one white group and that's what I'm actually leading up to now. And when I post in that group was the Genealogy Addicts Anonymous group. <laughs> I like the, the whole name of the group. They allowed that to happen in their group. Um, because they understood the fact that bullying does exist in genealogy. However, their particular um, thoughts when it came to bullying was not what we were talking about, which I found very interesting. Um, but the bullying they were talking about was uh, people who didn't, like uh, Yaya was saying, uh, people who didn't post it, you know, didn't respond back as far as trees were concerned or um, what was another thing that they said? Uh, people who, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't what we were talking about. But th those things that they were talking about were actually bullying tactics. So I, my, my, I'm wondering in general, you know, what other bullying tactics do you guys see out there as far as all of this is concerned and how, what ways do you think that we can address it so that we can make it a comfortable thing for all of us, both black and white? Because I want people to understand, especially new, new, this new coming generation of genealogists, I need for them to understand you cannot, both black and white, you cannot tell a white person, I don't want your information, especially when your grandparents' stuff is sitting in their, in their attic. Please don't tell nobody in mine, my family like that, because I need that information. Um, you know, and whether you realize that or not, that's the information that you have to get from them, and you're going to make them scared to talk to you. You, someone else later on. That's that's what that's gonna drive them away, and vice versa, because there's gonna be information that they're gonna need from you, and then and you're they're not gonna come to you and ask you about that because they need to find something out from you in order to find out more about their family because they're connected to you as well, and they're not gonna come to you. So what do you think? What do you ladies think? How do you think we can engine? How do you think we can, you know, best help our new generation of genealogists to understand that we have to work together in order to make this whole thing work? Well, if I can jump in, it goes perfectly with the last point you just made, Donya. When you think about the work that the Black Settles descendants in Edgefield have done to correct the settle, the White Settles lineage, and the work that our research group has done with the White Holloway, Matthews, and Pope family and Abney families in the old 96th district of South Carolina. That was a whole lot of African-American genealogists who sorted all of that out because we had to do that work to figure out who our white ancestors on those various lines were. That was the only way that we could do it was actually getting all of those really tangled, messed up. This is even coming from bad lineage books to get that all kind of done, dusted and correct. Um, also, Renata Yarborough Sanders made a good, really good point is if you are the, if you're the one who's being attacked in one of these groups, it is a, it is a very isolating lonely experience when you know people are seeing you being bullied and no one steps in to like stop it, say, right. hey, you know, hold up. So I just, just Renata made a really good point on that one. Right. 
I, I wanted to say too that I hear a lot of people talk about how the descendant of the enslaver might have the information in the attic or whatever. That hasn't been my experience that most of us don't have any information, but what we are doing is researching. And if we develop relationships with people, then we're keeping in mind while we're researching what they're looking for. And that's what happened to me. I started to see names. I started to put pieces together that I would never have put together if I didn't personally know some of the people who were looking for that information. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that people should treat people a certain way to try to get something out of them. But if you do develop the relationship, then it's much more likely that both parties are going to keep in mind what the other is looking for. Well, that's what I mean. The thing is, is that unfortunately, there are places where you're going to be able to get something quicker than I am simply because you're white. It, it, I mean, it's, it's sad, but it's just, it's just that simple. And you'll be able to pull something because you're white. So mm -hmm. because you and I have a relationship, you could probably go into this um, library and say, hey, can I get this? But you're actually getting it for me. And, mm -hmm. and it's sad that you would have to do that for me, but but that's what I mean by pulling it out the attic. I'm using it as a euphorism or, or whatever, but but right, that's what right. I, you know, and but that's what I mean, yeah. So you can these go are talk the to people I can't talk to. You can go talk to people who won't talk to me. Ex and that's what I mean. Right. I can go talk to people for you. We need mm -hmm. each other because of this one thing. And they, I need people. They can't mess that up for they, they can't mess that up for us. I need people <laughs> to not mess that up. Don't mess that up for us. Um, I was getting it was a, a thing and it went away. One person, Kylie says, another form of bullying, selective moderation. For example, a group that enforces a rule about posts needing to be related. Yes, needing to be related to research when group members post about 1619 project, but same moderation allowed people to buy and sell Civil War artifacts within the group. Oh, I'm not, I haven't seen that one. But I mean, I, I want, I want you to be able to post what you want. There's no such thing as, I, I moderate, the African-American genealogy form. And there is no such thing as a warning. One person said, well, can we get a warning? I'm gonna say this here, like I said it then, I did not get a warning when I was doing research one day and I found the flyer of the little black baby sitting while an alligator was sneaking up on that little black baby and the white hunter was coming up behind the alligator to make get him to shoot the alligator so he can make him a belt and some shoes. The black baby was a bait. I didn't get a warning for that. Oh, so nor did I get a, nor did I get a warning about my two times great grandmother being a breeder. There was no warning for that. And you're not going to get warnings for those things. Yeah. And there was no know. warning for a white person learning that their grandparent was a slave owner. That's a hard thing for a white person to learn. That's hard but, for them. I just wanted to clarify that for, for, for the viewers is what you're talking about is in a specific group, someone was basically, someone responded to this conversation. Well, if some, before someone posts something, if they could give us a heads up that they're going to post something that may be mm -hmm. upsetting. But as Donya said, genealogy doesn't work that way. We can find a document that just sends our whole head into just a tailspin. No, no, you don't get warnings with this. You don't, and I mean, you don't, you don't get warnings with genealogy at all in any kind of way. You, you it's there's no. I'm gonna tell y'all just like Janice said. There's a feeling she got a feeling about her tree. I have a feeling that my uh, that my great grandfather was hung. I just have this feeling. I don't have any reason for it. I don't have, um, I can't find him. He disappeared after 1910. That's it. He just disappeared after 1910. 
Um, I want to say goodbye to, to Bernice because she has to log off. Thank you for being on with us. Thank and you, um, we appreciate it so much. But as um, as I was saying, I, I, don't, I don't have a reason for it, but I can't find him. He just disappeared. He was there in 1910 and then boom, he's gone. And I believe he was lynched. No reason, but I don't have a warning for any of that. And I am not going to be shocked if I find that he was. So. And how can I warn someone about seeing a, a slave deed or a, a state inventory that has a list of enslaved people? If you do African-American research, you know that and, you know, your family was enslaved. That's part and parcel. Right. That, I think a, Tierra Doom wrote up on here. She said, if somebody is is attacking someone, then they're not doing real history research. Right. That's literally what she wrote up here. Right. And, and, and it's, it's, I mean, there's just nothing else that you could say. It's that you're not, you're not doing the actual research. So I'm going to, I'm gonna, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Okay. No, I was going to say, um, I'm one of the moderators for, um, I've traced my enslaved ancestors, um, group. Um, and that was a group founded by Van Slock, and he does an amazing, amazing job. Yes. And one of the things that he focuses on is making sure everyone sticks to the topic and everyone is treating everyone accordingly. So with, with the moderators, we try to make sure that we are, you know, looking at the, at the flagged posts to see what's going on. There are certain topics that we, that, that are just not allowed because people don't understand the difference between historical lens and current lens. They, they just don't understand it. So we're not even going to have a, a real discussion about it because it can, the conversation can turn really, really ugly. And sometimes he has to step in and gather people's lives because it gets petty and it gets unnecessary. Um, but one of the things that I try to practice is when something is flagged or I have to give somebody a redirection. I try to make it a teachable moment as nice as I possibly can because maybe they didn't know, but when I see that they're just being combative and they did it on purpose, then they have to go. There, there, there absolutely is no warning behind that because sometimes because people, people know what they do. They absolutely know what, what, what they do and they know what feathers to actually ruffle. There are very sensitive topics that people are triggered by. There are topics around rape, around Con, con, um, around consensual relationships, things like that, that are, that are very triggering to people. And everyone has to be respectful and mindful of that and understand that everyone's story is not the same. Slavery is way too complex to put it in a, in a box. So you cannot equate one person's circumstance or an overall gist of brutality to everyone's particular situation. Yes, it absolutely happened. But how dare anyone try to negate or be dismissive of anyone's particular family history or their, or their individual story? And what I have found is doing corrective narratives, and I actually had a, a conversation with a guest earlier today. She found a white um, relative who's the fourth cousin. And she mentioned, you know, it was difficult for her to try to reach out. She just, she really didn't want to reach out. And I said, well, you know, I have the same issues when I see people come to the planta one of these plantations and they don't look like me. I encourage you to come. Because if you want to humanize these people, don't you don't just do it from afar. There may be information at that particular location that may be something of your ancestor or someone's ancestors. These people need descendants. They need to be recognized, except outside of chattel, outside of movable property. And I said, well, you may be upset that she is white. How do you know she's not black? How do you know that she is is you know her family could have been possible? We we don't know. So just have an olive branch and reach out. And if she's not receptive, then then that's then okay. Then you know how to proceed with that. But don't, when you find things like that, don't take it offensively. Everyone has a story. We're humans first, beyond yes. racial makeup or anything. You have to remember, humans do human things. And just because you may see her as a fourth cousin doesn't mean it happened during slavery. It could have very well happened, you know, maybe a hundred years ago, 80 years ago. It could have been something that you just don't know. So you have to be receptive and open to the possibility. Now, here's another form of, of both not well bullying and just being culturally insensitive. So I'm a member of the Sons of the American Revolution Facebook um, group. 
And I can't, it was sometime over the summer, Confederate statues were being torn down. So a couple of people had posted in there about how outraged they were about it. And I countered with, well, first of all, these are Civil War people. Why is this even a post in the Sons of the American Revolution, which is supposed to be about and limited to the American Revolution, specifically ancestors who fought, um, getting guidance, advice, exchanging information, that kind of a thing. So that, that was my first point. But then one of them further went into it going, using language about savage Native Americans who massacred his family, parts of his family. I'm like, well, first of all, I've got Native American DNA, not Native American, will never claim their Native American identity. I have Native American DNA. Second of all, they weren't savages. They were fighting to defend their land and their families and their cultures from invaders. There is no other way to, to, to put that. These people, the people that were encroaching on their land were not indigenous to the country that they were living in. It's like, so can we please not use words like massacred? If you want to say that a part of your family died during you know, a particularly bad confrontation with a Native American tribe, that's one way that you can put it. It's the educator in me. You know, instead of just saying, oh, you used a really poor choice of language, I try to give them other examples of ways that they could have put it. But it's like, at the end of the day, given, given the focus of this group, I'm sorry, but I think that the article is entirely irrelevant. Thankfully, the moderators agreed. It took them a little while to get them down, but they, they did take those, po those posts down in the end. Um, and to at some point, I really would like to talk about language and framework. Because language is, language is something that we take for granted, but as history shows us, language is perfect for propaganda and use in sending out kind of sub-messaging and, and subtext and, and all of that. And um, I hope that we do get a chance to spend about 10 or 15 minutes kind of talking about, talking about that later on. We'll go into, I, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, um, uh, to your point about language, it kind of ties in with um, the primarily uh, white oriented genealogy and even historical groups like you were just saying. I mean, I think so much credit should be given to groups like I've traced my um, enslaved ancestor yes. and for even having these conversations and allowing these difficult conversations to take place because you can't do it in those other groups at all. I, I posted in a local historical society, it was a, a list of jurors from like the 1820s, 1830s. And I just commented, and of course they were all white men and people just lost their mind <laughs> because mm. I mentioned the word because I pointed out that they were white, because of course the unspoken subtext is that we're all white, that's the norm, you don't have to say it. If you do say it, you must have a political context in mind. And so these other groups, I mean, you can't even start to have that conversation. It was funny because the fellow was gonna to talk to the admins and I am one of the admins, so <laughs> uh, it didn't work out well, but um, I, I just, uh, I, I think it's amazing that we're even having these conversations and able to have respectful conversations. Well, maybe we should have had both you and um, Vance up here, Yael, because I'm telling you, I, uh, the African-American group, we can have this conversation in our group. If he's and sending I, me a link, I promise you, he'll be on, if he's asking. <laughs> well, he want, I can send him the link real quick. Do you want to get in? Because yeah, yeah, please send him the link. Well, I'm getting ready to send him the link right now because he needs to he need a class, he needs to give a class because at this point <laughs> we you need to know amazing. how to have really? this. Because I as I'm really trying to, you know, um I, I love the group and um but I'm I'm on my wits I'm on my wits end because I with the African-American form, I have, without calling out, of course, without calling out the people, there have been several times where I've gotten messages that have said things like, I'm tired of random white people dropping information like they can do this. 
I'm looking at that thing. I'm like, oh, I can't see people do the same. I've, I've been caught, you know, when we do, when we, I, I think sometimes people go come in your inbox, but if, and, and, and they call you out your name, or they tell you that you're being let a cool. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something about me. Stuff like that. So I, I, I get it. I get it. Let me tell you something about me. You're not gonna call me out. My name is still stay in the group. I'm gonna tell you that now. <laughs> Because that's a whole nother monster, but we're not gonna do that on here. So but the crazy <laughs> thing that the, the example that you were given, Donya, wasn't the crazy thing was that was a response to someone who had a document or documents that listed yes. enslaved people. Yes. That, that, okay, so it is that one. That was the one that actually fried my head. Yes. Going, this lady has information that may not help you. It may not help anyone in the group at the moment, but there may be a future group member who will see that post. Oh, that's my family. That's, yes. that's the estate inventory I've been spending five years trying to find. Yes, yes. And um, Vance, check your inbox, because I'm about to send you the link. I ain't even gonna lie. I'm, I'm telling you that right now, so you can, can I, jump in. Can I share an example? Sure. Um, and this ties into what Yaya was saying, right? Those te having teachable moments is so important. And sometimes for the folks that are upset, you know what, maybe they need a response that, you know what, don't get upset about this. Just what, exactly what Brian said. This person may have information. It might not be able to help you right now, but it may help someone else. Um, and then the other thing is sometimes people just have, they have their own set of ideas. And that is why, and I'm gonna keep saying this, you can't fix what you don't face. So let's keep talking. Hopefully this won't be the last conversation that we have, right? But just like we tell kids in school, bullying is never acceptable. We're adults. Why are you exhibiting childish behavior? And I, I go back to what I just said a moment ago. Sometimes it's what's in here, right? And sometimes what's in here has to be corrected. And sometimes it's about perception. I'll give you an example. I was at a library, an, an event at a library. And it was, we were, rep, um, we were representing our organization, our chapter, Ox, New Jersey. But at the same time, we had postcards for lost souls. And that dealt with a judge in New Jersey where enslaved people were supposed to be freed at a certain point. He decided to sell them to Louisiana. So they were gonna be a slave even longer. Well, a woman walks slowly up to the table and she's looking at me and she says, hello. And she goes, hi, my name is Janice. And I was like, oh, my name is Janice. And she was white. And I said, well, you know, is there, you know, how are you enjoying um, the session today? And she started talking, but then she, I just felt it like she was just so uncomfortable. And I said, well, what's wrong? And she said, oh, she picked up the card that had lost souls on it. And she said, um, I'm a descendant of the judge that sold the enslaved people. And she was whispering. So I looked at her and I said, well, why are you whispering? And she was like, I was mortified when I found out that I was a descendant of this person. And I said, okay, but she was afraid. Now, it wasn't my responsibility for her not to be afraid, but it was her perception. So what I decided to do was just to keep talking. And we actually exchanged telephone numbers. And when we spoke for the first time, we talked for two hours. If more situations happen like that, we'd have less of the bullying. So in her mind, her perception was that all black people are angry with white people. <laughs> and I explained right. to her, you were not your ancestor. Let's right. have the conversation. She kept just saying, I feel so bad. I feel so bad. I feel so bad. I said, okay, what happened was wrong, but we're doing the right thing. A black person and a white person having a conversation about what happened in history. And then during our conversation, we talked about a lot of the things that were going on. Some of the things she said, it was from her perspective, but I was not going to back down and correct because some of the things that she was sharing with me about what was going on now is wrong. It was wrong. And she said, I never thought of it like that. So there is power in having teachable moments. There is power in having conversations. About what so if you're like, well, what is your point? My point is this, we have to stop cutting ourselves off. And when, and when something is not right, let's correct it and let's try to have the conversation. And then if that person is just closed mind minded, they don't want to hear it, then you know what? Back up, you may have to block them or you hope that they stay to see the conversation is taking 
place and that we're moving forward. So I'm a witness that you can reach out. She came to that table. She was afraid. And my point to her was, first of all, you can't generalize black people and, and oh, I'm afraid of all black people or, oh, I'm afraid to talk to you. But I got her to let her guard, the, get rid of the fear and to have an honest conversation. And on both sides, if something is not right, number one, correct the narrative. Number two, if the behavior is just off, sometimes adults act like kids. If the behavior is off, let's correct it and let's move forward. Other than that, then you don't want to correct it. Now to Stacy's point about the facts that are there, right? You're entitled to your opinion, but you are not entitled to the facts. So. Mm. The, the way to really hmm. fix it is let's come to the table, let's have a real conversation and let's try to fix it. And when I say, let's try to fix, fix it, there are generations coming behind us. So we don't need the wrong information or the wrong attitude or the wrong spirit to perpetuate itself. That's why we, we are where we are now. Somebody made a comment about all of the money that's being donated and, and the companies that feel bad about what's going on. Guess what? You can put all of the money you want out there. You can build whatever you want to build. If you don't fix the systemic racism or the issues, we're going to have the same thing. And one group is going to feel better than the other. One group is going to feel angry. One, And it's just always going to be a mess. But when do we really sit down, put the issues on the table, have a serious conversation and fix it? Stacy, if the, if, the, if the folks that were on the jury, whatever the case, were all white men, they're white men. If somebody got upset with me about it, I was like, why are you getting upset with what was factual? It's factual. It was there. So that's my, that's where, that's my point of being here today and what I want to convey. Bullying is never, ever acceptable. I don't care who it is. So, but, but is. let me say this uh, on, on your point. It is said that black people are the most forgiving people on this earth. That's what that's what it said. Black people are the most forgiving people on this earth. So to for for the Janice that came up to you and 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 was very hurt because of that happening and so on and so forth and you were able to say that that's almost not that's a natural thing for you to do to be like you're not your ancestor. But let's flip it. What if that was flipped and something like that happened? They're not as forgiving for, right, right. for us because you automatically assume that that's something that black people, it's always assumed that black people are, are, are doing certain things that this just natural for us to be that way or, or something to that nature. This is why we're, we are the way that we are. We're just naturally like that when in actuality okay. we're not. This is, so, really, really uh, mean, this is a really mean question to ask you, Donya. And then I'd, I'd really like to pull Stacy in for, for a minute. But the question I have for you. Cut the air off. Cut the air off. Sorry. Go ahead. Do you remember, you were telling me, this was probably about a year ago, about the number of capital offenses that meet at an immediate death sentence to a white person and then the number of capital offenses that would meet out death, a death sentence to black people. Do, mm -hmm. you remember, do you remember what those numbers were? I think it was like three or four. It was in the speech that Frederick Douglass did for the 4th of July, um, when he had to do the speech for the 4th of July. And um, I think he said that it was an it was an astronomical number. I can't remember the number directly, but it was <laughs> like, it was about 10 times more. It was like, to, yeah, it was like 10 times more. So if, if, if black men had 77, then it was only four white men. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was this astronomical number. It was unfreaking believable. The, 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 the number was so crazy. And um, yeah. And I, because it dovetailed perfectly with what you were saying, but it also does tell nicely into what, a lot of our panelists have been saying in different ways, that is ingrained in this country. That is ingrained in the society that this country created. And I got into it because classmate, a former classmate from Connecticut and I were going back and forth. And I made, I can't remember what sparked it off, but I made the comment, non-white people did not create the society and culture in this country because we never had the power 
to create a society right. or a culture. All black and brown people have ever done was try to navigate it, understand it, survive it, adapt to it if needs be, and in some, some way, shape or form, have some measure of prosperity or you know, livelihood within it. But right. it's never been our, but it's never been our culture. And he got really angry at that. Right. Really, really angry at that. And I'm like, I'm not apportioning blame. I'm just saying it is what it is. We've, you know, we've done our best. And again, I, I think that's a point that does tell what you were saying. But before we broach too far off the off the, onto another topic, I wanted to bring Stacy in to kind of talk about her journey as a descendant of a descendant of enslavers, you know, um, I don't think I've ever asked you this question, Stacey. I mean, have you, have you met descendants of people that your family enslaved or that that ancestor enslaved? I have. When I first found the will of my fourth great grandfather that had mentioned enslaved people, um, I went out looking to see if I could find anybody on ancestry. One of them had taken the family surname in the 1870 census. And so I, I built a story for him and started looking for people who had them on his tree, on their tree in ancestry. And I've been in touch with four or five descendants now. Um, one in particular, we've become friends. Um, so it's been, um, uh, for me, I'm all like, like Donia was saying, I'm always surprised at how welcoming people are. And um, I, I just, it's been a, a very emotional experience, but very, very fulfilling um, to have made those, those relationships. Um, so is that, is that what you were asking? And I guess what, you know, leading up to the, I guess the, maybe the first, right before the first time you, you actually met them, I mean, kind of what, I mean, did you have any, I don't want to project anything onto you, but did, I mean, did you have any kind of qualms, any fears, anything that you thought might go wrong? Um, it, it was a little scary to reach out with the information. I basically just messaged people and said, I have some information about so-and-so, um, you know, do you want it? And um, people wrote back. And once we got into the conversation, really no, because I, I, you know, I was a little afraid they would, I don't wanna say blame me as the descendant of the enslaver, but um, have some feelings toward me about that. And nobody did, they, they really just wanted the information. Um, and um, one of the descendants and I um, just hit it off and we talked a bit. And then one day he called and said, I'm gonna be down about an hour south of me you know, come down and meet my sister. And um, I went down and talked to them and he gave me access to his DNA. And we had suspected before that, that we were related. Um, and through the DNA, not, not, um, not the DNA I had access to at the time, but a, a first cousin once removed, um, we, we found that it is true. Um, so it was just interesting that we had that kind of instant connection mm. um, too. But the relationship has just been a real, blessing to me um I, I hope to him also wow thank you wow well um vance thank you for joining us you, you're, you're muted you're muted <laughs> hello so how how have you been able to um i wanted to ask how have you been able to control your group to the point where you're not having the overall um, attacks because I, I I will admit the African American genealogy form is is a constant uphill battle for me. Well, my group is going to be partial one way or another. I learned a lot of history because I was not afraid to go to people of any colors, and we dealt with each other. I reached out to my white enslavers' families. Some responded, some didn't. I even got a family book from them. We deal with each other in my group one way or another. That's life in general. You know, apparently a lot of folks didn't go this route and a lot of people were apprehensive of people of other colors and all that. But at the end of the day, we're all people and we're going to get along in my group or you're not going to be in this group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the problems that I am, so like Brian said, when this when this first started, we started seeing all of this when the George Floyd incident happened, and I think a lot of people started joining um, 
several of these groups went because you know it was just anything black they felt like this was the group to join right right and right. it wasn't it really didn't have they didn't some may not have known that it was an actual researching group or what have you so on and so forth and I, I want them to understand that it's not a political group. It is a researching group where everybody is researching and everybody is is doing working together like your ancestors, like like the I've traced my ancestors. I, I'm in your group. And I, I do I, I do see what you're doing. I mean, I've traced my enslaved ancestors. Mine don't talk. I can't get mine to talk to me. <laughs> But that that's just who they are, but I they don't do it. So and I'm not hurt behind it. Um that's not the the direction that they want to go, and that's fine, and I accept that and, and I'm cool with it. But um as far as the African American genealogy form, that's the name of the group. So you cannot just it, it says that it's a genealogy form. That's what the group is. Pauline is in it, Catherine is in it, Stacy, everybody in here is in this group. And we, we all help each other research. But if someone comes in this group and they ask a question, you cannot attack them regardless of their race, ethnicity, what have you, and say, why are you asking this question? That's not your place to ask this question. These are the kind of questions that happen in my group. These are the kind of things that happen. So how do you approach that? Well, first, first I had a little experience. What is that echo? First, I had a little experience. This happened during presidential elections. In 2016, we had an influence of mad people, white and black. And they was posting inflammatory posts, starting and trying to start race wars, flame wars. We shut it down. So now we got a little experience. You know, I marched with George Floyd's nephews, by the way. Uh, they came to Columbus and I kicked it with them. But uh, when that stuff tried to come this year, we just started nipping it in the bud. You know, at least I did have experience, but we, I let people know. Genealogy come first. Slavery happened. Get over it. You can't equate today's times with yesterday's climate. I mean, today's climate with yesterday's time. That's what people are doing. Times are kind of messed up now and they want to go back to slavery. We're not having that here. This is genealogy. This is research. At the end of the day, us talking with white folks and backing each other, we're solving and knocking down more brick walls. I'd rather have a great genealogist than an agitated food. Well, I was told at one point that I was making the white people comfortable. Straight up, I swear that is exactly what I was told. Word. That I was making the white people comfortable in the group. That's what I was told. And and that's when I came back and I said, making the white people comfortable, there's nothing comfortable about genealogical research. That was my response. There's nothing comfortable about genealogical research. But what you're not going to do is come in here and constantly attack people. I'm and I'm just I'm not gonna let it happen. I'm not gonna let it happen. So these are the things that are that are actually happening in the group, and this is why this particular form is being is being done. You know, um, I, I I have to curb my tongue because I have to curb my tongue. <laughs> I have to curb my tongue. <laughs> so, Let me ask you: How many moderators and administrators do you have? We have, there are three, there is, it's, it's three. And I probably need to add more because I can be really mean, but um, I mean, I can, I can be really mean. I've hope so I have, I've, I've created rules. Um, and now with the rules, you have to agree to the rules in order to get in. If you don't agree to the rules, you're really not getting in. Like, I'm just deleting you. I'm declining you right away. Um, I've also created questions. If you don't answer all three questions, you're not getting in. So you have to answer all three questions and you have to agree to the rules. But I actually think these people are... Um, answering the questions and agreeing to the rules just to get in. Like, I feel like it's an infiltrate. It's, a, it's they're li like literally trying to get in. They gonna catch a side of me. And, um, well, I would say that you're mean. 
I would say you're direct. You are very direct. You're so sweet, cousin. What's wrong with that? <laughs> I'm mean. What's wrong with it? <laughs> Sometimes you got to be that way. Okay. Uh, let, uh, we got 12,000 or 13,000 people in our group. For every okay. one person that we let in, we probably turn away seven. You know, it ain't about popularity, it's about people. And we ask questions that make them have to give thought out answers. That kind of weeds some of the stuff. And like I said, we gonna come to the defense. You know, they jumped on some lady that found out she was descended of Thomas Jefferson and all, uh, uh, uh. And I, I wasn't there when it happened. Once I found out about it, uh, uh, we nipped it, we neutralized it. Yo, you know? I, read your, I read it and I was like, this post right here, that was me that said that. <laughs> So I loved it, but I mean, I'm just. Well, actually, Henry Henry Goins has made a really good point. One thing I hadn't even considered, to be perfectly honest with you, in terms of Facebook groups and moderators, have moderators from different time zones. That way you can make sure that the group is monitored for a good chunk of the day. Okay, so oh, I see it. So, um. All right, well, then I'm getting ready to start looking for some West Coast moderators, and um, I'm going to yeah. need that. Also, and for those that's asking the question, I am talking about the African American Genealogy Forum. And um, Kate Turner oh. said, don't describe yourself as mean, Donya. You're just setting boundaries that need to be set. Right. Kate Turner, I mean, I, <laughs> I, I can be very mean. So, no, I'm, I am setting boundaries, but I can be mean. But yeah, <laughs> be honest and, have, and direct. The folks that are jumping on other people, my whole thing is, okay, that's how you feel. You're angry. You don't like it. Go sit down somewhere and deal with it or go go look at the history. It's it's real. So That's what they need to do. Right, they go need to go look at the history. Put that energy somewhere else and educate yourself. And then for you, Danya, there is the block or delete button. It's the delete button. I'm trying not to delete them because they need to know the history. If you, especially if you are a, if you, if you are a new genealogist to the group, I don't want to delete you. I, I did. That's the, that's the, um, the educator in me with this because I want you to learn and I want you to know. And, 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 and I want you to, to understand, because like I said, coming in the genealogy, it's taught me so much. And because it's taught me so much, I want everybody else to know it too. Well, you know, Dante, and, what I mean by that is, as Jaya said, right? You have your rules, we can have our teachable moments. And then if you don't want to be taught, goodbye. Well, thank you, Jen. You're not gonna disrupt my group. You're not going to do it. So sometimes we try to be so nice. And da, 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 da. But if you don't want to follow the rules and educate yourself and treat people the way that you want to be treated, we're not we're not enabling negative energy and a waste of time. And again, that's if you don't want to be taught. I'm going to say in the, the words of Morpheus from The Matrix, a mind cannot be opened before its time. You get what, and Donnie, you know who I'm thinking of. You just need one group member to be so disruptive that it disrupts the whole group. Exactly. It's, it's just not worth keeping them in the group, keeping that one person in the group when no, all they do, all they do is negativity, attacks, and disruption. I have a question for y'all. How many times do you spend on the uh, teachable moment with the person? How many times? One. That's it. Thank you. And I try to be nice. And Vance can, even, Vance can even attest to this. Like, because they're like, you know, you said that very articulate. And then I'm like, yeah, you should, you, you should know the things that I don't say. Because it can really get, like, you know, very blunt. And sometimes they come off rude. So I try to be, I try to say what I have to say. And that's going to end it. I'm not going to go back and forth and argue. Because I know, because I will argue. And, but I'm not going to do that. But you can't, and, then, and this is going to sound bad, but you can't say stupid, unfortunately. Because some people just want to act stupid. And they want to say stupid things. And every feeling is valid, but feelings aren't facts. And people don't understand that. They need to understand that. You, you can say what you want to say. You can feel all, you can have all the feels in the world, but it does not make it fact. 
And when you're when a person is com, is purposely combative, and sometimes I hate I hate to say this as well, but it be your own people. It really does because you try to help them and 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 show them, okay, well, this may not be appropriate, or look at it from a different perspective. Get out of your get out of your box. But they don't want to understand it, and they think you're pacifying white people or doing this or taking up. No, it's just showing you human life. Be Treat people with respect, treat people with kindness. As we said in the beginning, genealogy is, it, it, it's about all the feels. Everybody's gonna feel everything. I don't want somebody to come in in a, in a militant fashion. I also don't want somebody coming in looking for sympathy because they feel white guilt. I don't care about your white guilt. I don't want your white tears. None of that actually matters to me. If you wanna take on that burden, that's on you. But I'm going to tell you what the facts are. I'm not going to take away. I'm not going to add on to it. These are facts. And you, you have to recognize that. And I think when people actually do and realize that we're not taking up for people, we're just saying, just be decent and in order. And that's it. Let me add, I used to be objective. The first six, seven years, I used to be objective. And I used to let people get away with all kinds of stuff, but I got seriously attacked. And at the end of the day, all that stress wasn't worth it. Worth it. I'm not so objective no more. Now, like I said, I'll come out on a couple of times. They got out of pocket. I give them two times to get out of pocket. They get out of pocket twice, they gone. So you just answered the question that Terry Burks just said. So how do you help those that bully un that bully understand they are bullying and make the correction? And that's basically what we're trying to do. These, this would, that's what this is about. They are bullying, so we are trying to let them know that it is bullying, and 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 that's what caused this whole thing, Terry. Um, well, actually, oh, you, Donia, you asked much earlier, kind of what one of the things that frustrates us, and you and I spoke about this. What really frustrates me in these groups are passive aggressive attacks. Mm. Woo! where someone says something so outrageous, but they close off and that's all I'm gonna say about it. Yeah, yeah, that's I a, mean- You can't do that. You can't do that. You don't, you, you can't, you, if, we're, if, if we're posting, if someone is posting something and, and they wanna, I mean, I, I, I like, I guess, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say this, okay, but I'm an old school researcher. I'm 48, but I'm considered an old school researcher. So I shouldn't have to ask you if I can post something. And it threw me off when someone asked in the group if they could post something. <laughs> and it just, it, it kind of threw me off. And then it threw me off even more when someone said, well, I, I don't want to see anything about lynching and, and things of that nature. And I'm like, well, then exactly. I, well, why are you in the group? This is this this shouldn't be where you are. This that lets me know right there that this is not the place for you. That lets me know this isn't the, because lynching is what this group is about, amongst oh, other things. Oh, yeah, you know, amongst other things. That's that's, that's actually what this is about. You're going to see things like that, and it, it you shouldn't worry. I don't I don't want to see those things. Well, then that's why you, you're in the wrong spot. Go we'll create the analogist then. We only right. want happy stuff. Yeah, there's no, and there's no such thing as, happy. right. And there's there's no such thing as that in genealogy. Right. So is there a group or something called the happy genealogist? What's that I'm something sorry, along there is, the, the line <laughs> of the, no, 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 I'm, I'm just saying, because I, I remember hearing that, but it's almost like if people don't want to talk about, I mean, you, you're talking about what's real. It's the difference between being pessimistic and telling the truth. You're telling the truth. There were lynchings. There was brutality. Yes, there were things that happened that we don't agree with. Things that the way people maneuver back then sometimes were survival mechanism, and we may not agree with it, but it, it's life. Such is life. People do people things. And to me, for someone to say they don't want to say anything about lynching is no different than someone coming to visit a plantation and asking a crazy question, or some people may think it's crazy, but I, I, I take it as, well, were they a good slave owner? Because they don't want to hear the the bad things. People have they they, they don't they want to erase it. You can't erase history. In order to heal from it or to understand it, you have to tell it all. You can't separate the two. 
Well, no, a good slave owner would be a person who wasn't a slave owner in the first place. You know, it's or it's it's so many things. Or if they would have just treated them better, would they would have worked harder? No, they wouldn't. Why do that? So, and people want to hear things like that. They want you to comfort them. I'm not going to comfort you with the truth. Or, or get the, or this because everybody thinks that. Well, there's so many African Americans or even white Americans that believe that all enslaved people were raped. And that's just not true. That's actually they have to tell you about that because we both had to post about that one because that is a first of all, to me, that's a trigger. Yes, it happened. But what if somebody's reading that post who was just raped? Now they're reliving all of this again. Exactly. Some of that is a survival. A survival right. method and tactic. Why? So for me, when somebody does that, you're literally dehumanizing them just as much as the person who put them up as property. You're taking away their human aspects as though they didn't have feelings. They didn't have thoughts. They didn't have, they didn't cry. They didn't laugh. They didn't have joy. You're taking the humanness from that person. Slave is a legal term. It is not who they were. It is literally a legal term. You aren't white person, free person of color. You're going to be a slave. That's what, that's what they were. So I'm like, if you're going to do that, you, just, just, you might as well open the door to the conversation of Black people owning other slaves. It is not them as a person. It is a legal term. But do not disrespect someone's ancestors because you feel as though they were raped or something. I get it. Yes, I understand. Yes, it happened. I'm not denying that in any context whatsoever. But, but you were not everybody. there. You don't know the circumstance. Exactly. That's it wasn't right. everybody. It That's wasn't everybody, fair. but they just immediately say, oh, all of my ancestors were this, all of my, it's like, first and foremost, I need you to, I need you to the research. I need you to just understand and know everything that went on. You do not know everything that went on. You're not researching. You're not studying everything. You're only going by the history that was taught to you or was told to you. That's it. You're not going by everything that's being done. And until you start doing that, that's when you come and talk to me. But if you don't do all of your research and all of your own history and study, please don't open your mouth to me because at this point, I'm about two seconds <laughs> off of you and going in a whole nother direction. And that's not what I want to do. So with that being said, either do your research or get out. And that's well, and I don't, I don't want to be that person, but y'all are giving me permission to kick people out. So <laughs> but that that was a teachable moment for me. The the the, the subject that we're, the subject that we're on now that was a teachable moment for me, because again, I was explaining how one of my enslaved female ancestors was receiving love letters from her enslaver from a Civil War battlefield. I mean, the language was just. I mean, it seems weird to say this for a woman who is enslaved, but beautiful. You know, you could really tell he had strong romantic feelings for this woman. And I was attacked. Um, and then I was trying to explain to the person, okay, we're talking about a period where women, period, couldn't, unless they were a widow, couldn't own property. Their families pretty much told them who they could and who they couldn't marry. They didn't have control over their own bodies. This, I didn't care if they were white, Hispanic, Latin American, whatever. That was the period that they were in. It's like now knowing that, now try to picture what life was like for an enslaved Black woman or an enslaved woman of color. If mm -hmm. even her white counterpart did not have the legal right to refuse her husband conjugational fun, what chance did an enslaved Black woman less than less than that right and they took oh, and what? Just, oh, oh, oh. there he, he took that on board and he really thought about that right or look at it from the perspective also you have again since it was a political engine you have people you have states in different places who had laws that prevented say manumissions manumitting mm -hmm. a person and so if they weren't legally if they couldn't legally do so now you see, okay, well, they were still a slave owner, but you don't know the historical context and what that was going for. They could have inherited those people, didn't even want them, but now they're considered a slave, a slave owner. I get it, but you don't know the circumstance. Learn research before you react. 
about what was going on at that particular time because again every circumstance is completely completely different and it's not fair to put everybody into a box or again invalidate someone else's story or minimize their history because you're every time you turn around we're going to scream um rape I, I know people that do this right now even in family groups and i'm like come like come on i i i understand that, that they were angry but re actually just 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 research and 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 it'll help it'll help actually help a lot because it's not fair it's really not fair to everybody and again that's to your point about language there is it never has been a framework in this country to actually talk about any of this. There's no agreed framework. There's no agreed shared vocabulary that we use. Because even I pull myself up, I get ready to say, oh, you know, Patrick Henry was a good slave owner because he taught some of his, you know, he taught his enslaved people to read and skills and, and all the rest of it. And I'm like, that's not really what I want to say. Exactly. He was a kind of slave owner because he did those things, but good. I'm like, but I don't, I don't have another word to be able to describe that because there's no framework to give me the vocabulary to describe that. Yeah, so that's the world. same for the Yeldell family because yeah. they, I mean, they, they, they gave their enslaved, they gave their, those that they enslaved good trades. They, you know, the kind of trades that when slavery ended, they were able to take care of themselves. So they were seamstress, they were blacksmith, they were carpenters, they knew how to read, they knew how to write. They they literally made sure that they could take care of themselves and they did one step further. They were buried with them when they died. So this was one, and this is in a, you know, Edgefield was a, a you know how Edgefield was, it was a crazy place. And it was, re, you, it was not thought of or heard of for the enslavers to be buried with their enslaved, but they were, they did that. And those were the things that they did. So that was different. That was something totally different, but those were the things that they did. But do you call them good? No, no, no you don't necessarily call them good. So, I mean, I don't know, but I mean, with that being said, that's coming off of the bullying that we, you know, that's, that's, that's definitely going away from the bullying that we originally wanted this about, you know, our goal is to try to fix or try to address how to stop the bullying within our groups. Um, so, Pauline, what is kind of your, your, your practice in that area? Just, you know, keeping group members kind of on the, the not necessarily the straight and narrow, but not, you know, how, how, how do you combat bullying? Who? Pauline. Um, again, just trying to calm things down first, you know, this, this, isn't really the sort of conversation that should be happening in, in this sort of a group. Um, and, you know, keep talking about teachable moments, you know, you're making this statement. Um, if you have evidence that that's true, let us know. Otherwise, you know, maybe you want to look at this evidence and think about it a little bit. And if they're, they're willing to open up to that is one thing. If they seem unwilling to open up to that, Hit the road, Jack. So what, what group, what other, that. huh? Let me add to that. I got a bunch of admins and moderators. I don't know how many, maybe 10, but they're all from different backgrounds, different cultures or, and whatever, different people. So we try to have it as diverse as possible. So we all get an understanding or whatever and somebody specializes in certain things. You know, I got one woman, Dolores Williams, she is getting your butt. <laughs> we need her. Hey, she don't play. But hey, you know, we got other people. You know, Ed Adams, he's a good, he's a teacher. Yaya's a teacher. Cynthia's teacher. Uh, Don, you know, she got, she's very articulate. We try to keep them as diverse as possible. Steve, he's very knowledgeable, and that helps. So, well, okay, so Pauline, Catherine, Stacy, in your traditionally white groups, 
have you ever had a moment where you had to um you where you've noticed where there are some African Americans in your group and they're not asking certain questions. Because like I said earlier, you know, I, I can't in the US South research group, I cannot ask questions in that group. I can't. And every because every time I did, they would attack me. And I don't think they realize that that is actually bullying. I think that's a huge problem in those groups is, is silence. And I have not resolved that for myself because um, saying anything that hints at race or is so politically charged right now, I almost feel like that's gonna have to wait until next year, um, hopefully. But uh, it's, not, it's not a question I've resolved for myself, but I think the bullying in those groups takes um, the form of someone says something once and then gets so attacked that they don't speak up again and other people stay quiet. Okay, Paulina, Catherine. I personally, I, I am the administrator for two groups. One of them is the 1619 genealogy group and I have been attacked by both white and black people. Um, number one, white people say, oh, I'm trying to um, change history. I'm not trying to change anything. I'm correcting a narrative. They don't want to accept it because they think that what they were taught in school is the, the God's truth, which has, it's nothing even close to what it's, what we're, you know, what we're talking about, what the documents say. Um, but then I've had also um, African-American people that ask me, why, who gave you the right to, to do this research or who gave you the right to write these books? Who, don't listen to her, she's white, she's given in a white narrative. I get both sides of it. I totally get the African-American side because if you look at history, they don't want history to repeat itself. We want the truth, right, to move forward. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. And when I have someone ask me, something of that nature of, of, I go back to the facts, I give them the research, or maybe I have a post up and they're reacting saying um, something negative to it, but it has absolutely nothing to do with what I posted. They just are making a combative statement. And I go, look, we're not here for that. This is a research group. I'm giving out the information that is documented. I'll provide a record if that's what they want. But I try not to engage with them because I feel like when you engage, it sometimes makes it worse. So that's some. That's what I do with my groups is I try to go back to the facts, go back to the research and say, hey, it's here. Wake up. This is what it is. And we have to move forward as, as a whole. And we can learn so much from from both sides. Yeah. I learned yeah. so much from, from both sides of the story. You want me to come in the group and ask them if they doing it? I, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Because that's, that's what I do. I, I'll do it. Because if they're not doing the research, then shut up. I mean, because I mean, if they're not, they're not doing it, why, why are you even worried about it? I mean, Again, You're not even doing, I mean, that's the whole thing in a nutshell. That's how I felt when the person was like, well, you're not enslaved, so why are you worried about it? Right. And and, and, and I'm looking at them like, well, you research your, your mother, your grandmother, you tell your children about your grandparents, right? And they're like, of course I do. And you tell your children about your great-grandparents, you know them, right? And they say, yes. And you shared your information on them. Am I correct? Well, of course I do. Well, why can't I share my children's my information about my grandparents to my children? They don't know them and they need to know about them. It's the exact same thing. There is absolutely no difference in it. Mine just happened to have been enslaved. Yours wasn't. That's the it's no difference. When I said that to that person, he literally couldn't open his mouth. There was nothing else he could say. There was no words, nothing. I'm just talking about my family. Just like you talk about yours, I'm talking about mine. So shut up. Well, that was another thing. That whenever Janice had mentioned earlier about when she saw that tree, 
I started researching African-American genealogy, the 1619 specifically to know who these people were 14 years ago now. And when I started, I had just found an ancestor of my husband's. Well, 13, 12 years later, I couldn't, I hadn't got away with that. I'd written four books. I'm on my fifth book about the whole entire subject, but guess what? Two years ago, maybe three now, I found out that the woman that my, is my main character in the book, which is a very factual, very documented book, is my 13th great grandmother. She was speaking to me, wanting me to push me. I couldn't get her out of my mind. I had to do what she was wanting. She wanted her to story told. She wanted her story corrected because she was part of the 1619 group and every they didn't even know names. People had just turned away and said, oh no, that's research is too hard to figure out. We don't, we can't figure this out. Yes, you can do the research. The research will tell you the research is there, but People have to take the initiative to do it. And that's what pushed me was my own ancestor. So we have to listen to what those feelings are that we are hearing inside of ourselves. And if somebody is, if it's a white person, and sometimes it's, a, it's hard to accept what your ancestor might have done. You're not responsible for them, but you're responsible for showing what you found. If you found that your ancestor was an enslaver and he had a hundred enslaved people, on his farm and, and there are names there. It's your obligation to give that information to the African-American community. End of story. It's, right. it's, mm -hmm. And it's a hard thing to do. It's right. not, I, I certainly, I, I haven't come across such an incident, but if I did, it would be horrifying for me to do it just to know that this man existed and he's in my lineage, but it'd be more horrifying to know that I didn't give the information to those hundred people's descendants to know what it was about, what, who he was, what he came from, where he's been. There is a whole story about every single person on this earth and it's worth sharing regardless of the pain. And that's my two cents. <laughs> I'm going to, can I, I just quick, oh, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. And sometimes it's a judgment call. Um, Catherine reminded me of something that I'm, that I, a comment that I responded to in a, in a white Virginia genealogy group. Someone, he, this guy was looking for information about, I think its name was Peter Goings from Mecklenburg, Virginia, circa, you know, about, born around 1730, 1740. Now, this guy was, you know, thought that all of his ancestry was white. He hadn't done any DNA testing at all. So everyone was giving him suggestions. I'm like, well, the Goins are pretty, it's like Goings could be a variation of Goins. And they gave him all of this, yeah. like 20 name variations that comes with that name. But it's like, if you're talking about an ancestor that's coming from Mecklenburg, Virginia, especially around, you know, right before the, the Revolutionary War, you may want to consider the very famous free family of color, the, Go you know, the Goins family. And a couple of people were like, well, you can't assume that every Goins is, is, going, to, you know, is going to be part of that free people of color family. It's like, well, first of all, I've just looked at my DNA results. And this was when Ancestry's DNA matching was much lower. It's like the guy that posted, sorry, not the, uh, the guy. I have found descendants of the Virginia line that the person who posted is talking about. I'm seeing people from extended parts of his family line in my DNA matches, which is why I was softly suggesting rather than like out someone on Facebook going, yo, bro, you know, you, got, you have an African ancestor in there somewhere. It's like, you may want to, if you're finding it hard to find who you're looking for, you may want to consider these other alternatives. Now, thankfully, the guy was really appreciative. Come to find out that was exactly the answer, the people that I was suggesting to him was exactly the group of people he needed to research. And he was able to push his research all the way back to the first, to the first goings in Virginia. But isn't it, uh, wasn't it already proven that all goings are related? No, there's two lines of goings we've proven through DNA. One of them is the African line that John Goins belongs to. There is a Goins line that does not match that, that is Egyptian. Oh, there's a Goins book that will be out soon on that topic. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Well, because this guy was told that his his 
family name was Scottish. I, Catherine probably knows a whole lot more about this, this theory than I do. There, there, there's a lot of family trees that you will see out there that put the Goings, John Goings descendants specifically as Scottish. I have to figure out where my goings go to because my my mom connects to everybody. So I I hate my mother's DNA, but that's <laughs> I know a anyway, lot of goings. Yeah, I, I I hate my mother's DNA. So um, can I, I add this real quick before y'all move on? Yeah, um, I had to switch locations. Um, so one of the things that I had uh, I put I put in the chat for us, but was talking about um posting in non-Black genealogy groups and being a researcher, again, I mentioned, I research plantation histories. Not, there's not many of us that actually do that and enjoy it, um, but I've noticed that many of those groups are, they don't have safe spaces for a lot of Black people to post. They, they are groups that are dedicated to plantation histories or photographs of the architecture of the gardens or or just plant, plantation life of the South and those who those plantations that have vanished for whatever reason. And the moment that a black person or I myself as a black person posts something in the group relative to persons who were slaves or enslaved, or talking about a some any any kind of black research from a particular plantation, it's not a lot of feedback. It's not a lot of comments for the post. And sometimes the post will absolutely be deleted because wow. it is not a safe wow. space all the time. Um, I remember putting up something about one of the plantations was doing a, an inaugural Juneteenth celebration along the River Road in Louisiana. And the post, the, 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 the admin said, she doesn't think that they would appreciate the post. So, she had, you know, so she didn't allow us to be posted. And I think that does a great disservice because I'm also looking at the architecture. I'm also also looking at the people who were in these particular homes and what was going on, not just during slavery, but also sharecropping days ju just as well. And I think that by, by them doing that, that shows <laughs> that some people still really have this fetish for this grand old Southern life, have it what may, but there are real researchers who actually want to find out to be able to help our own selves, but help other people locate information and to be able to bridge a gap to learn from each other. We're not, I'm not coming into the group to try to say, oh, well, I think you should burn all plantations down. I've, I've heard conversations like that. And it's very, it's very, for me to work on, work on some, I'm like, okay, well, do I have to protect myself? But, but that's a whole different thing. But it's, it's like, okay, I'm coming here. I'm trying to see what information is there. I wanna, I wanna enjoy photos just as well. I'm not promoting slavery of any kind of context, but don't shut off my voice from something that I have to say that may be of importance to someone else. That's just really not fair. Okay, so are you sitting at a slave quarter? Yes, I actually am. Woo. Yeah, I got well, this is a replica. I got yes, this all is actually a replica. In emotion. This is a replica so of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a replica of a cabin. Uh, it's actually one of the cabins that I try to take people into uh, all the time. I don't like to do talks out just in the open. I want to bring you into the space. I want to show you. I want to show you what the spaces look like, whether that's walls of names, and just so you can, so people can get a better idea that they are not just this people. Uh, a reward in a news news ad that said 200 Negroes on there. So these are real people. They have names. They have identities. And I think that's something that is extremely, extremely important for people to know that where, that where they're walking is where people also walked. It's where they laid. And it is, should always be a sacred space for people to come and learn outside of themselves. So um, after this is over, I have a show idea with Yaya. Mm, I know Just, what it is. So I agree. <laughs> I, agree. Um, I got a show well, idea. <laughs> here's a form of bullying that we haven't talked about. One of the worst cases of bullying that I've actually had didn't occur on Facebook or social media. It occurred on Ancestry.com and it involved my family tree. So 
I use a methodology called the beyond kin approach. And it's all about putting enslaved people with slavery related documents. It could be an estate inventory and you list all the enslaved people as you put the document as the spouse, all the enslaved people as like pseudo children of the enslaver. It's just a very convenient way. It's the way that my mind works. I can scribble things and put things in Excel, but actually seeing it in a family tree format, I can start to make connections. So it involved one of our Edgefield families. I'm not gonna say, say which one, but there was a lot of enslaved people involved. And while this person knew that their family was um, had enslaved people, the reality of coming to my family tree and seeing something close to a thousand enslaved people listed like that, I guess, totally freaked her out. She spent a week and a half demanding that I take all of that down. And I'm like, well, first of all, our, our mutual ancestor is going to be the father of some of these kids. And also some of these enslaved people will be his siblings, half siblings that his father father um and again trying to explain to her trying to explain to them that again with ancestry you know especially having ancestry dna could provide really good clues as to who were you know who were lost siblings who were additional children all of that kind of stuff she didn't care about any of that all she kept saying and some a couple of you have mentioned about feelings are not fact emotions are not fact this is the perfect one for you um, that's pretty much what I came back to her with going, you know, I'm sorry, this is my tree. This is our family, our, our common mutual ancestor. I'm not taking it down. Wow. Well, it is, it has been a two hour show. <laughs> and I oh. just, wow. yeah, we, we are two hours in <laughs> and I just, um, I want to thank everybody for um, like really coming in. I want to thank Vance for coming in an hour into the show. Okay, and thank, you. Um, thank you so much, Janice. I am so sorry. I forgot to introduce you by name at the top of the show and I felt so okay. bad about that, but thank you. Uh, I thought Janice was introduced. I introduced myself. Yeah. yeah. So um, I do want to um, thank Vance for coming in and we will have a listing of everybody on this uh, on, on in the comment section and what they do and, and what they represent. Um, thanks, Bernice, for coming in at the first part of the hour and Vance pulling up that second half of the hour. Uh, I am looking for, for those that need to know, I do moderate the African American Genealogy Forum and another group, the Home Place Group, which is a private group that's for Edgefield researchers only. Um, and uh, I don't have that problem in my Edgefield group, but I do have this problem in my African American genealogy form group. And I am officially looking for moderators for all time zones. And um, if you are interested in, in being a moderator, please hit me up. I appreciate everyone's feedback on here. And if any of you would like to be moderators on here, please let me know. <laughs> because I need the help. Um, I also appreciate everybody on here, you know, having this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Yaya. <laughs> uh, and, um, I appreciate all, all of you guys' help and just having this conversation. Um, thank you to our wonderful panel. Yes, this panel was awesome. You guys have been awesome. Um, I, I Thank you, Brian, for indulging me because I was going crazy that day when I sent you that message like, we need a show. <laughs> so, because <laughs> this, this stuff has just been bothering me to just, we have to, you know, we have to, we have to be able to talk. And I, I believe that genealogists can heal the world. I believe that. Well, I'm a big believer in leading by example. And I think collectively, both, you know, in terms of people commenting, because there have been great comments and great com side conversations going on with the audience. Yes, it has. Panel, we're walking the talk. And yes. I, I think that sometimes, and specifically with this country, that you have to demonstrate that. Right, right. Like I said, I believe genealogists can heal the world. I just do. I think we're great people. So thank you again for just being a part of this show. and. Um, 
I've got we a will see you guys tomorrow. I've got a couple of housekeeping keeping things. So our schedule show for tomorrow with um about the Negro Green Book Motorist Guide has been postponed to January, so we apologize for that. Dong and I will be having a conversation about exactly what it is we're going to be talking about tomorrow, but the show will be going live tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we have a lot of new people um, watching us today. Um, you will find loads of genealogy and kind of American history, uh, facts, research tips, techniques, strategies, all that kind of stuff on genealogyadventures.net. You will find us everywhere on social media. If you look under Genealogy Adventures, we're on Instagram, Twitter, Fit, Facebook, YouTube. I think we're on everything except for TikTok. I don't get TikTok. So, we're, so I think that's the only one that we're not, we're not on. But yeah. I don't want TikTok. <laughs> We are really, really easy to find. There's loads of episodes, loads of articles. So knock yourself out. Um, I hope that they help you on your genealogy journey. Thank you once again to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for spending um, so much time with us today. Thank you at home. Thank you for and having us. Thank yes, it was a privilege. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. It really, really has. It's been it a great really conversation. Has. You ladies and gents are awesome. So. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna have Pauline. We need to have you on the show, Stacy. We all we just need to have Janice. We need to have all of you guys on the show one day for just something, whatever you do. We just need to have you on the show. Just talk. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So until tomorrow, four o'clock. Be here. We're gonna be Thank happy. You. Negro Motors. Don't forget. No, that's January. No, we we're still talking about it though tomorrow. Okay. Oh, that's right. That's what you need to tell me. Yeah. All right. All right. Bye. Bye, Thank everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. That was awesome. Yeah, it was. I told you it was going to be at least two hours. <laughs> you did. And it could have gone further. I told you. I told you. <laughs> sure did. So we have a man by the name of Calvin Ramsey. He wrote a book called Ruth and the Green Book. It's a children's, um, it's a children's version. Oh, but he okay. also did a playwright about the Negro motorist. Oh, brilliant. So well, we have him. Cool. Um, I have a website for him. I'm gonna give you, send you pictures and we could do a write up for him. And he's gonna do it. And I gotta send all his stuff to him tonight. Awesome. Well done. So I was able to find someone. The girl Lisa was not able to only because she had a prior engagement for Sunday. That's fine. That's fine. But so well done finding anyone because I was I was striking out. Yep. But I was able to find somebody. So um the the idea that I have for Yaya. And because she's in Louisiana, it probably won't be too cold for her to do this, would be during Black History Month, is to actually have her do a tour of the slave plantation. That's awesome. Which one, which one does she? Does I, she I don't, I don't know. Oh, wait, we're still live. Well, if you send me the video file, I, or if you- Wait, wait, wait. 